products. At 11.30 Eastern, senators will turn to a federal district judge nomination in Florida. A vote on that is set for noon Eastern. Senators will break at 12.30 for their weekly party lunches. They'll be back at 2.15 Eastern to continue debate on the FDA user fee bill. Live coverage now of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have been faithful to help us when we have lifted our hearts in prayer. Thank you for your providential care of this legislative body. Open the eyes and hearts of our lawmakers so that they will know and do your will. Lord, guide them in the way they should go, providing them with wisdom to solve challenging problems by depending on your guidance. Help them to think of each other as fellow Americans seeking your best for our nation rather than enemy parties seeking to defeat each other. Replace distrust of each other with a deep commitment to creative compromise. We pray in your sacred name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., June 26, 2012, to the Senate. Under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3, of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Christopher A. Coons, a senator from the state of Delaware, to perform the duties of the chair, son Daniel K. Noway, President for Temporary. The Majority Leader. We're currently considering the motion to concur in the House message to accompany the FDA bill post cloture. We hope to work something out on that that we can uh, move to it early evening. The first hour of debate this morning will be equally divided and controlled with Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the final half. At 11.30, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the nomination of Robin Rosenbaum to be a district judge for the Southern District of Florida. At noon, there will be a roll call vote on confirmation of the Rosenbaum nomination. We're going to recess today from 12.30 to 2.15, as we normally do on Tuesdays for weekly caucus meetings. At 2.15, there will be six hours and 15 minutes remaining on the motion to concur in the House message with respect to the FDA bill. We hope a significant amount of time can be yielded back and we can complete action on the bill today. There's a briefing at 5 o'clock. All senators briefing. We're going to continue. Uh, that time will run. We're not going to recess during that period of time. That will be in the classified room down in the visitor center. Mr. President, we've accomplished a lot. I, everyone knows how grateful I am to Senators Stabenow and Roberts for working our, their way and our way through that very difficult farm bill. Um, we're watching very closely the great work of Senator Boxer, Senator Enhoff, and um, the Finance Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Banking Committee, and helping us work through the Highway Bill. There is a possibility that we can get that bill done. I think the chances today are better than 50-50 that we can get a bill done. But we're still looking at um, Speaker Boehner to help us get that over the <clears throat> finish line. So we will see what happens <laughs> on that. Mr. President, we have, as I've indicated, the FDA bill will complete that tonight. That's a very important accomplishment for us. We have the student loan issue that we're working on that. We hope to get that done soon. 
I think there's a general feeling that uh, we've worked out a compromise on that that's acceptable with the help of Senator Baucus and Senator Harkin and others. Jack Reed, of course, has led the charge on that for some time. Uh, I've talked about the highway bill. We need to get that done. Mr. President, the remaining issue is flood insurance. And we are doing fine on flood insurance, except I'm told last night that one of the Republican senators wants to offer an amendment. Listen to this one. Uh, wants to offer an amendment on when life begins. Uh, I think that this, some of this stuff is just, you know, I have, I, I have been very uh, patient working with my Republican colleagues and allowing amend, relevant amendments on issues, and sometimes we even do um, non-relevant amendments. But really, on flood insurance, are we going to have to start dealing, as we did with the highway bill for weeks and weeks, with contraception? Now, we have another person who uh, wants to deal with when life begins. I don't understand what this is all about, but I want everyone to know this flood insurance bill is extremely important. The big pushers of this bill are Republican senators, veteran Republican senators. And they'd better work on their side of the aisle because I am not going to put up with that on the flood insurance. I can be condemned by outside sources. My friends can say, let them have a vote on it. There will not be a vote on that on flood insurance. We'll either do flood insurance with amendments that deal with flood insurance, or we won't do it. We'll have an extension. After all the work that's been put on this bill, this is ridiculous. That somebody says, I'm not going to let this bill go forward unless I have a vote on when life begins. I am not going to do that, and I think I speak for the majority of senators. Now, if the Republicans won't stand up to that person that's going to do that, I'm not going to. I have tried my best to uh, deal with these issues that have nothing to do with piece of legislation, but with uh, the end of the month staring us in the face. We have so many important things that have to do. Student loans will be doubled if we don't get it done. Flood insurance will disappear if we don't get it done. Highway program will disappear if we don't get it done. FDA bill would create all kinds of problems if we don't get that done. I think this is outlandish. Let somebody, if they feel uh, really moved upon to talk about when life begins, have them come give a speech here. The chair announces the business for the day. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. The clerk will report the pending business. Motion to concur in the House Amendment to S-3187, an act to amend the Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, and so forth and for other purposes. Under the previous order, the following hour will be equally divided and controlled by the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the final half. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
call be lifted? Without objection. Mr. President, I ask to be recognized to address the uh, Senate. Mr. President, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here this morning. We've had a lot of news uh, in Washington, D.C. and across the country uh, over the last few days. Um, decision from the Supreme Court regarding immigration laws in Arizona. We're expecting, anticipating a decision by the Supreme Court uh, later this week in regard to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, front and center are, are issues that are important to the country. Uh, we were successful last week in, uh, in approving here on the Senate floor a, a so-called farm bill, an agricultural uh, bill, again, that has an impact upon uh, many in our nation. Uh, I want to make certain that we don't uh, lose sight of what remains, to, in my view, that should be front and center. Uh, and all the things that people ask government to do and all the things they want to accomplish in their own lives can only occur if there is a good and growing economy in the United States. And so while I certainly wouldn't call any of the other issues that, uh, that we're addressing here a distraction, they're all important, uh, I want to make certain that my colleagues understand that we have to come together to make certain that uh, Americans, individuals across our country can access a job, can feel secure in the job they already have, and can have the sense that they have a future where they are employed or that if there's uh, a need for a change in job, there's, that opportunity exists. Uh, job creation is something that the federal government can't do in and of itself, but what decisions, the decisions we make here very much affect whether or not the private sector can have the level of confidence uh, in the general economy, uh, a regulatory environment, a tax code that is conducive toward the private sector uh, creating jobs uh, in the United States economy. And this matters certainly from my point of view as a member of the United States Senate in that with job growth, with a growing economy, we are better able to pay down our national debt. Uh, in my view, if we're going to get what I consider the most serious uh, circumstance that our country faces today, the deficit and the debt, if we're going to get it under control, uh, I, I don't foresee how that happens without a good growing economy putting Americans to work. And of course, from the individual, individual's point of view, it, it's, it's important, it's a component of our lives, something that's important to us, that we figure out how we earn a living, put food on our family's table, save for our kids' education, save for our own retirement. Uh, and so while the issues that are being addressed uh, uh, here in the Senate and across the country and across the street at the United States Supreme Court matter so much, uh, we, ought, we must not, cannot lose sight of the fact that we've got to create an environment where jobs uh, are front and center. And of course, we know the economic statistics today, uh, the unemployment rate, 8.2% uh, uh, has been above 8% now for a long time. Um, the, the presiding officer uh, uh, this morning here in the Senate and I have introduced legislation that the, the primary function of which is to create an entrepreneurial environment that startup companies can grow and prosper and in the process put people to work. Uh, it is about growth that I think uh, that, that we need to continue to focus on. And uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity of working in a, a manner with the Senator from Delaware, Senator Coons, and others to see that we do that. The, the topic I want to specifically address this morning, and I was reading the Wall Street Journal last week, and this article caught my attention. I'm of the view that for economic growth to occur, and especially to occur in the communities across Kansas, the state I represent, uh, we're going to have to have strong and, and viable community banks. Uh, and there's a regulatory environment that makes that much more difficult. And, and the, the article that the Wall Street Journal uh, included in, uh, that I want to speak about, at least briefly this morning, is the headline is, Small Banks Put Up for Sale Sign. And the, 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 the content of the article is very much about how small banks are now selling to other banks. And the primary reason this article focuses on, the, the reason that that's happening, a growing number of tiny community banks are deciding it's time to put up the for sale sign. Many executives of these small lenders are frustrated by costly new regulations. It talks about a bank uh, in Iowa, in, o in Ohio, in uh, Texas. It talks about a number of banks in which the bank, uh, the, 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 the individuals who own the bank never had an intention of selling. Uh, this was their livelihood. This is what they expected to uh, pass on to the next generation, to the next set of stockholders. 
But because of the regulatory environment, the article quotes these bankers as talking about how it's no longer any fun. Uh, a 66-year-old CEO is quoted as saying, quote, I don't run a bank anymore. I run around trying to react to regulations, and frankly, that's no fun. And so why this is important is certainly important for the people who own and, and run a bank, but it matters in communities across my state that there is access to, to a local lender, to, to, a, to a relatively small financial institution that knows its customers, that the farmer, the rancher, the small business person has the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the individual that they're borrowing money from. And I, I know from my own circumstances of, uh, of growing up and living in rural Kansas that the likelihood of being able to get a loan from the community bank, the banker that you know, who knows you and knows your ability, your credit worthiness, your, your trustworthiness, uh, that's a pretty special relationship that we've got to be very careful we do not lose. If you're trying to borrow money from somebody you don't know, it's a different circumstance. And so I want to highlight once again this regulatory environment, not just for banks, but for all businesses in which the decisions are being made. We're not expanding. In this case, we're selling. Uh, and the reality is that has consequences to every American, to every American family. Job creation uh, is going to be improved whenever we have a regulatory environment that encourages economic growth, not discourages it, and a regulatory environment that is certain. So much, particularly in the, again in the financial services industry with banks and other financial lenders, the uncertainty that exists in large part because of the passage of Dodd-Frank and now its implementation, the uncertainty of whether or not more regulations are coming and what those regulations are going to say and do, uh, they certainly can drive up the cost. We certainly want to protect consumers and we, want, we operate in, a, in many instances in a regula regulated environment, but these regulations need common sense and need to take into account the specific circumstances, particularly of a small bank. My small banks in Kansas had virtually nothing to do with the financial debacle of 2008, and yet they're burdened with the responsibility of complying with a huge new set of regulations that resulted from the efforts to address the financial crisis of 2008. In fact, uh, this article again points out that uh, the board uh, meeting at uh, this small bank, um, the binder of information delivered to the bank's board before the last monthly meeting included 419 pages of information to be reviewed. Banks more and more are having to put people on the payroll to try to comply, compliance officers as compared to uh, those kind of circumstances in which the bank is making loans. So the cost of doing business, the cost of credit increases, uh, and the access to credit is diminished, again, diminishing the chances for uh, job creation. Um, one of those items under Dodd-Frank was the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, and I, I, this hit me uh, while I was visiting one of my banks at, at home in Kansas. They told me the CFPB had called and said they were sending, I think the number was 12 uh, examiners and two lawyers to come spend more than a month in this small bank examining the bank. Again, these are banks that had little to do with the financial collapse of 2008 almost without exception, our community banks, uh, certainly in Kansas, they didn't make loans to people who were unlikely to repay those loans. They didn't make loans to people who had no ability to, to repay those loans. And they didn't make loans without getting proper documentation and seeking the necessary uh, credit worthiness uh, of that borrower before making that decision. And yet the burden of these regulations falls uh, directly upon them. And while I guess I'm speaking in, in support of trying to change this for the benefit of the bankers, who this really is to benefit, if we were to change the regulatory environment, who this would make a difference for is the person who wants to borrow money, who wants to buy an automobile, who wants to buy a home, who wants to buy a piece of commercial property, and yet they go to the banks uh, in communities across Kansas and are told because of the new regulatory environment, this is a loan that we cannot make. And the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, which has 12 examiners and uh, two lawyers, uh, soon to visit a small bank uh, in Kansas and intends to be there for more than a month. The regulations that, that uh, the Consumer F Financial Protection Bureau, they haven't even created their regulations yet. So they're out auditing a bank before the regulations are in place. Uh, and the 
uh, my re reaction when the banker told me this was, well, I need to go back to, to Washington, D.C. and see if I can do something. And I was thinking through the appropriation process. I happen to be the ranking Republican on the Appropriations Subcommittee for Financial Institutions, Financial Services. And I thought, well, we need to rein in the uh, CFPB uh, through the appropriations process to get them kind of within their sphere of where they belong in a much more common sense, less intrusive way. And it occurred to me, the, the light bulb went off, is I don't have that ability. I can be a member of the Appropriations Committee. I can be a member of the United States Senate. I can actually be the, the, the lead Republican on the subcommittee that's responsible for, for financial services. But because the way the CFPB was created, its money is an automatic draft from the Federal Reserve. And so we as members of the Senate and Congress in general have no input into the level of funding of an agency that is going to have dramatic effect upon the financial institutions of this country and therefore the individuals, the consumers that those financial institutions serve. Um, in addition to that, there is only one person who administrates the program, who is, a, who is the administrator of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Unlike the CFTC, unlike the SEC, where there is a commission or a board in which there's a collective decision made, uh, there is only an administrator. Uh, I've introduced legislation. We've had this uh, conversation on the Senate floor before, and I would encourage my colleagues to look at that legislation that would reformulate the way that the CFPB is, uh, is managed and directed and would once again give Congress the opportunity to have input into how the CFPB functions. I would never try to explain to Americans or to Kansans how great Congress does its job, but I do know that our ability, uh, the, the fact that we're uh, subject to election, the will of the people of America every two years, uh, gives us the opportunity to have the people's input into the administration, into the regulatory process that is so burdensome now upon um, in, in so many businesses, including our financial institutions. So my, my effort here today is to highlight once again that what we do in, in Washington, D.C., and in this case particularly what the administration does, what the Obama administration does today and what administrations have done in the past in regard to regulations, very much has a consequence upon whether or not Americans are going to live in a country with a growing economy uh, in which there is a sense of security and people know what to expect, or whether they are going to live in a country in which the a, a business owner, a small business man or woman in Kansas or across the country is holding back from hiring employees because they don't know what next is going to come from their own government in regard to regulations that are costly, drive up the cost of being in business, and reduces the chances that we have expansion uh, of our economy, which means reduces the chances that Americans can have good, solid uh, employment opportunities. I uh, have two daughters graduating from uh, college, one uh, a couple years ago and one uh, this year. Uh, the job market certainly is important to me as a parent. The ability for a young American to find a job and to pursue that job, to be able to afford to pay back the cost of an education is something that um, we need to seriously take into account. And while we are going to have, I assume, a conversation again here in the Senate uh, this week on the cost of borrowing money for students and student loan interest rates, we ought not forget that the most important thing that we can do to help our students once they graduate is to make sure that uh, the economy is such that employment opportunities are available. It doesn't matter what the interest rate is if you can't find a job. Uh, and we need to make certain that we do fulfill our responsibilities to the American people to see that the economy, job creation is front and center for the benefit of every American uh, and for the benefit of our country's deficit that is um, it's, it's so important that we create a, a, a growing economy. Uh, and uh, I, I again would, would highlight how important it is for us to get the regulations under control and particularly criticize the circumstance in which legislation that does not pass Congress somehow takes effect because the executive branch concludes that they can do what we refuse to do by executive order or by rule and regulation. It, it's time for Congress to reassert its role, and it's time to make certain that in pursuing that role, we create an environment in which jobs are front and center, and the American people can all pursue the American dream. Mr. President, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the Senate today, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Arizona.
Mr. President, I didn't hear all of the remarks of my colleague from Kansas, but I think that what I have to say will uh, follow on directly. At, uh, I saw a prominent news magazine, the cover of which had a likeness of President Obama, and the title was The Imperial Presidency, or The Imperial President. And uh, the theme of it was that this president seems to believe that by executive order or executive action, he can simply do what he wants to do, irrespective of whether the Congress of the United States has passed a law authorizing it uh, or has in some other way uh, directed the president to carry out a particular policy. When the president takes the oath to see that the laws of the country are faithfully executed, uh, that's a requirement of his, of his job. Our three-branch government has the legislative branch and the president jointly deciding what the law is to be when Congress passes laws and the president signs them into law. It then has the president required to execute those laws. Now, he doesn't do it personally. He does it with the Department of Justice, uh, if it's something relating to national parks, the Interior Department, and, uh, and so on. But the Department of Justice has a big part to, roll, uh, to play in this, as does the Department of Homeland Security in respect to immigration laws, because the Department of Homeland Security has now taken over all of the immigration functions, and that relates to customs, to issuing visas, and of course enforcing the laws against illegal immigration as well. And so it's not up to the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, or the Attorney General, or the President to decide whether or not to enforce a law of the country. That's their responsibility. And then the Supreme Court uh, resolves differences about the meanings of uh, the statutes, their application, and whether or not they're constitutional. Now, uh, earlier this week, yesterday, the Supreme Court uh, determined the constitutionality of a law that the state of Arizona had passed to deal with the problem of illegal immigration in my state of Arizona. It's a serious problem there. About half of all the people who cross the border do so in the Tucson sector. And the results of that on Arizona have been devastating over the years. The damage to the environment, uh, creating forest fires, uh, the, the problem of the people who try to cross the border in the summer and end up dying in the desert because it is a very harsh environment. The people who uh, are brought across the border by unscrupulous coyotes, they are called, uh, the smugglers, who then badly mistreat them, who hold them hostage for ransom from their families, uh, perhaps in Mexico or Central America, who mistreat them brutally in, in many cases. Uh, the problems of crime law enforcement has to deal with, the hospitalization uh, and medical treatment that they're required uh, to receive under the law. All of these things have had a dramatic uh, negative impact on my state, as a result of which the state legislature said, to the extent that the federal government is not enforcing the law in our state, we will try to help fill that gap in cooperation and coordination with the federal government, and they passed SB 1070. And the key feature of that, which was this cooperation between law enforcement, was upheld by the uh, United States Supreme Court. Uh, now, what has been the Obama administration's reaction to that? Uh, the, the Obama administration has reacted by saying, well, we don't like your ruling, and therefore we're simply not going to cooperate with the state of Arizona, as we have been in the past, or any other state that has laws like Arizona, even if you, the Supreme Court, says that it's constitutional. Now, the, the petulance is, is uh, um, and the arrogance of this are something the American people have to judge, but from a law enforcement perspective, um, this to me suggests that the, the administration is creating some very serious problems. It was one thing for the administration to say as to eight or 900,000 uh, primarily students who, who came here because their parents brought them here illegally, we're going to find a way in effect to suspend their deportation so that they can go to school or work here. We're just going to not apply the law to them. And, and, and uh, it's one thing for the Obama administration to say that, which it did last week. It's quite another for it to say, and by the way, we're going to treat all the other Ill illegal immigrants here the same way, the 10 to 12 million people who have been in the United States for a while, who crossed the border uh, some time ago. Uh, in effect, that's what the administration has said. And even if local law enforcement, like the Phoenix Police Department, uh, sees somebody weaving down the road uh, in the manner of a drunk driver, stops the individual, determines that, uh, that they uh, are driving while intoxicated, 
they have the right to then say, may I see your driver's license? And if the individual cannot produce an Arizona driver's license, that's already a violation of Arizona law today. Uh, but if, for example, he says, well, here's, here's my matricular card from the Mexican embassy, that may be reason for the officer to say, hmm, maybe you're not here legally. So in addition to violating Arizona law by driving while intoxicated and not having a valid Arizona driver's license, uh, I have reason to believe that you may not be an American citizen. Ordinarily then, that individual, uh, that person's name uh, is called into a federal database, I think it's up in Vermont or New Hampshire, and there's a verification. Either the individual is or is not in the United States legally. And then if the person is not here legally uh, and hasn't been convicted uh, or accused of a major crime, they're turned over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. That's the part of Homeland Security that is supposed to take these uh, illegal immigrants and then decide what to do with them. In most cases, they're simply removed from the United States or deported. Uh, now the administration is saying, we're not going to do that anymore. We don't even want to know whether the individual is an illegal immigrant. We're not going to check, and we're not going to allow you access to the database to check. Up to now, the uh, uh, Phoenix Police Department or Maricopa County Sheriff or Cochise County Sheriff can call up that database and say, we have this, this name of this individual. Is that person legal or not? And the administration is now saying it's not even going to allow Arizona to check. So, Mr. President, this is a condition expired. This is a condition which cannot be allowed to stand, where the administration is not enforcing the laws of the United States. Congress is going to have to take what action we need to take to ensure that the president enforces the law as he is sworn to do. Mr. President, Senator from North Dakota. Mr. President. I rise today to answer allegations made by the Washington Post in a front page story in yesterday's edition. Here is the story, high level talks, then changes to holdings. First I want to say I have great respect for the Washington Post. In many ways the Post is a national treasure. But even great newspapers make mistakes. And in yesterday's story they made assumptions that are simply wrong. The story said my wife and I shifted savings in her retirement accounts from mutual funds to lower risk money market accounts on August 14th of 2007. That is true. They showed that we made those changes a day after a call from Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson to me. That is also true. But their suggestion that the two are related is absolutely false. They have made the same error in logic that we studied in college. The case in faulty lo logic involved an observer who noted that people were fainting and street pavement was melting. That led the observer to conclude that melting pavement caused people to faint. Of course, that was wrong. It was 106 degrees outside. The proper conclusion was that heat was causing pavement to melt and people to faint. That error in logic was about causality. And that is precisely the error the Washington Post made in their story with respect to me. What the Washington Post missed in their graphic, and to be fair to them, they largely had the correct context in the story. If you read the whole story, it was fairly balanced. What was not balanced was the graphics that accompanied that story. Now let me show you the graphic. This is from the Washington Post of yesterday. Here's a picture of me, quite a nice picture. I appreciate that. Um, it says, Senator Conrad, Chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, was in contact with Paulson about the nation's economy during the crisis. That's true. They then show a timeline with only two points on the timeline. They show August 13th, Secretary Paulson called me at 4.30, and they show the next day, August 14th, that my wife and I shifted from her retirement accounts money from, from mutual funds to lower risk money market funds. That's true. What they've not shown on the timeline are what was happening in the previous days. So let's go back to the Friday before. Here's what happened on the Friday before. 
The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 200 points within minutes of, opening, of the opening bell and closed the day down nearly 400 points. That's not on the timeline of the Washington Post. You know, if they were going to be fair, and I don't begrudge them writing the story. I think if I were the editor, I would have certainly written the story too. You know, it certainly has an appeal. Here are members of Congress talking to people in influential positions and then changing their holdings. But to be fair, you've got to provide the context within which those decisions were made. And the context within which my wife and I made our decisions was pretty clear. The Friday before, the market drops nearly 400 points. What the Washington Post also didn't put in their timeline is their headline on that Friday. Credit crunch in U.S. upends global markets. And in that story, the Friday before, they showed that in the weeks leading up to our decision to diversify our investments in my wife's retirement account, the market had dropped in two days more than 500 points. Leading up then to the Friday where the markets dropped almost 400 points. And the Washington Post, in their story, also didn't put on the timeline what the headlines were in their own paper on the weekend leading up to our decision to make these changes. This is just one of the headlines, looking for footing on shaky ground, talking about the turmoil that we saw globally. So the truth is that what made my wife and I decide over the weekend to shift some of her retirement accounts from mutual funds to less risky money market accounts was what was happening in the markets themselves. <laughs> that is what led us to make these decisions. The Paulson call was not about markets. Notes from my staff indicate that Secretary Paulson was calling a number of members about the importance of raising the debt ceiling. The Secretary of Treasury was not calling me to make, uh, give me stock market tips. He wasn't talking to me about the stock market. He was talking to me about the need for a debt limit increase. So I want to say clearly and unequivocally to my friends at the Washington Post and anybody who read the story, the call from Secretary Paulson had nothing nothing to do with my wife's and my decision over the weekend to shift some of her assets into less risky money market accounts. Those decisions had everything to do with what was happening in the marketplace itself, which was widely reported even on the pages of the Washington Post. And what was happening in the markets was readily available to every investor. We were not shifting uh, my wife's retirement accounts based on some secret inside information. It was, let me get back the headlines if we could. You know, it's the Washington Post. Credit crunch in U.S. upends global markets. Stock market in two days in the weeks leading up dropped 500 points on the Friday before the decisions we made over the weekend, the market dropped almost 400 points in a day. The Washington Post's own story, they had a big story. This is the story showing the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 200 points within minutes of opening and dropped almost 400 points for the day. Why didn't they put that? They wanted to be fair. Why didn't they put that on the timeline? That's what I asked them to do. I didn't ask him not to run the story. I asked him, put in the context within which the decisions were made. Be fair. So the fact is, there is nothing Mr. Paulson could have said to me about market risk that would have been more persuasive than the drop of 400, almost 400 points in the market the previous Friday. That provided all the motivation that my wife and I needed, along with the 500-point drop that had occurred several weeks before, that provided all the motivation we needed to make a decision 
to move some of her retirement assets to lower risk investments. To the Washington Post, I respect you. I've had a very good relationship with you for a long period of time. But your story was unfair to my family. It was unfair to me. And fundamentally, it was unfair to your readers. Because the graphics you supplied with the story failed to provide a full or fair timeline and the full context that led to our decision. In fairness to you, if you read the whole story, much of the context is there. But the graphics, which of course most, is what most people are drawn to, have none of the context and don't have a timeline that in, in any way is fair. Finally, I just want to say I'm retiring. This is not going to affect me for the future. But the notion that members of Congress should just stick with whatever investment decisions they made when they began investing or be accused of trading on insider information is to me absurd. Our trades should be public, no uh, public knowledge, and they are. How did the Washington Post know about these trades? Because my wife and I reported each and every one of them in our financial disclosure. So trades of members should be public, absolutely, and they are. The Washington Post and others should monitor for evidence of insider trading, and they do. But they should also provide context to their readers so they can fairly judge if all of us have taken action or any of us have taken action with our investments that are dishonorable. I have not, and that is the truth. I thank the chair and yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from West Virginia. Mr. President, I have four unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. And I ask unanimous consent that these requests be agreed to and that these requests be printed in the record. Without objection. Mr. President, since we first began consideration of the FDA bill, I have stood on this floor again and again to highlight the importance of an amendment I offer to this legislation that is very significant to my fellow West Virginians and all Americans. This amendment would put tighter controls on drugs containing a substance known as hydrocodone, a highly addictive prescription painkiller that is destroying communities across this country and leaving families devastated by abuse and addiction. It was a proud moment for me when the Senate came together across party lines on May 23rd and unanimously adopted my amendment to reclassify hydrocodone as a Schedule II substance from a Schedule III. In practical terms, this means that those who are using hydrocodone for illegitimate reasons would have a harder time getting their hands on it. I cannot tell you how much this amendment means to the people of West Virginia and to every law enforcement group fighting the war on drugs across this nation, who believe very strongly that limiting access to hydrocodone would give them a powerful tool in combating prescription drug abuse. So it pains me to stand here today following last night's vote to move forward with the passage of the FDA bill, which did not contain this such, such important amendment. Mr. President, uh, that is because the influence of special interest groups suppressed the voices of the people, not just in my state of West Virginia, but in yours in Delaware and all across this country, who are begging us to do something about the prescription drug abuse epidemic. According to the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, prescription drug abuse is the fastest growing drug problem in the United States, and it's claiming the lives of thousands of Americans every year. Prescription drugs are responsible 
for about 75% of all drug-related deaths in the United States and 90% in West Virginia. These narcotic painkillers claim the lives of more Americans than heroin and cocaine combined. But the groups opposed to my amendment have a huge financial stake in keeping these pills as accessible as possible, and I understand that. And that is why my amendment was stripped from the FDA bill that we advanced last night. Mr. President, high-powered and well-funded lobbyists may have gotten their victory this time around, but I can assure you I will not give up this fight, as I know many of my colleagues won't either. I am hearing on a daily basis from my constituents in West Virginia and all around this country who are counting on us, their elected representatives, to do something about the prescription drug epidemic ravaging their communities. Since I offered this amendment, I have heard from so many West Virginians who have seen a ray of hope because we might be able to do something about this problem. I won't pretend that it'll solve it completely, but it is sure a good step in the right direction. So Mr. President, I'm coming to the floor to share the stories of the people of West Virginia in the hopes of bringing people together around a solution to this terrible, terrible problem. Here's a letter from Sheila from Charleston who sent me this letter and supported my amendment after losing a close family member. Sheila writes, please continue to fight the drug companies and pharmacies regarding this issue. Our family in the last two months lost a beloved family member to prescription drug overdose. He was a promising young man that lost his life because of addiction to pain medication. Our family continues to be devastated, wondering how did this happen? He came from a highly educated family that was involved in his treatment, and we cared deeply for him. His family spent over $100,000 in his recovery, but it was all too easy for him to obtain legal prescriptions. What truly makes it more painful is he was showing signs of overcoming his five-year battle. Now, we are not blaming anyone but the system. We know we are each responsible for our own actions. I have thought for years that our health care system is far behind in technology and record keeping for doctor shopping and prescription dispensing. Please understand I am very much opposed to more government in our personal lives. However, this is much needed in the medical arena. Please continue to fight this enormous battle for all of us. Mr. President, that letter could have come from you, constituents, my constituents, any congressman's home district, from anywhere in this great country. The fact is, I don't know a person, whether it be us in the Senate, our colleagues in the Congress, or anywhere in America, that someone hasn't been affected by this abuse of legal prescription drugs used in the wrong manner. It touches everyone's life. It's of epidemic proportion. I've said it before, and I will say it again. I understand that limiting access to illegitimate uses of hydrocodone pills doesn't necessarily fit in the business plan or the model of selling more product. But there are times when even the best business plan can be altered while staying successful. And certainly one of those times is when the health of our country and the public good is at stake. In fact, the Huntington Herald Dispatch, the second largest newspaper in my state, located right on the border between West Virginia and Ohio, describes why this amendment is so important. Congress is missing out on an opportunity to close the spigot at least partway on the large volumes of commonly abused prescription drugs that flood the country and harm so many Americans. Mr. President, in 2010, the most recent year for which data is available, a study showed that there was 28,310 recorded instances of toxic exposure from hydrocodone. The same study showed that 24 million individuals have admitted to abusing hydrocodone drugs for non-medical purposes. Unbelievable. A different study put out by the Centers of Disease Control in November showed that more than 40 people die every day from overdoses involving narcotic pain relievers like hydrocodone. Isn't it worth doing something to get the pills out of the wrong hands? My amendment may not have gone into this bill yesterday, but it's not going to go away. I think we all know that. And I'm determined to see this thing through to the end. Mr. President, while the people of West Virginia, and I know in Delaware, are disappointed in the outcome of the hydrocodone amendment, I do, I do want to highlight one measure that was included in the legislation that we're both proud about. Uh, it's important to me and you and everybody in this body. It would make the sale and distribution of synthetic marijuana and other synthetic substances, which are known as bath salts, 
illegal by placing them on the list of a Schedule I controlled substance under the Controlled Substance Act. These drugs are also taking a terrible toll on all of our states, and I was proud to co-sponsor this provision with my uh, friend Senator Schumer. I want to thank Senator Schumer for his leadership in getting this provision passed. Finally, I want to close with one more story from my home state of West Virginia as a way to remind you of what I'm fighting for and why. This letter comes from Rebecca, a woman who started a group called Mothers Against Prescription Drug Abuse as a way to deal with the terrible realities that have accompanied her son's five-year battle with prescription drug abuse. Jamie was a great kid growing up. He played basketball, football, and baseball. When he was 14 years old, his team won the state tournament and went all the way to Wisconsin to play in the regionals. Jamie was always helping others and had such a kind heart. When Jamie got out of school, he married his high school sweetheart and was employed in the mines. After that, he just went downhill. He began abusing prescription drugs. For two years, I tried everything to get help for him and tried to get him to stop. Things only got worse. He lost his wife, he lost his home, his truck, and then his freedom. My story is typical to so many families out there who are struggling with loved ones that are addicted. They just want someone to listen. They need to be able to reach out to someone who understands the nightmare that they go through daily and know that they are not alone. The addict is not the only one who suffers. The family members carry around guilt, sadness, shame, anger, hopelessness, fear, anxiety, and et cetera. I could go on and on about how bad this experience has been for me and how it has not stopped. I will continue to fight prescription drug abuse for as long as I have a breath in my body. I will not give up on my son or anyone else who's addicted. The things need to change within our system. We cannot continue to allow just anyone to have access to prescription pain medicine. Parents need to be educated while their children are still at home. Communities need to be aware of crimes, drug dealers, and report them. Doctors need to stop prescribing pain pills to people on the street, and they need to be held accountable. What happened to our medical ethics when people who need pain medicine for a while are given strong addictive pain medicine, only to have to keep coming back to the doctor over and over again for refills? Is it greed that is behind the beginning of this growing epidemic? Doctors definitely profit from the addicts' return visits as well as the pharmaceutical companies that make the medicine. We know there is a problem, but what are people going to do about it? I'm doing what I can, but it is not enough. Will you all please help me? For Rebecca and all the other mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers out there who are help, pleading for help, we owe it to them, Mr. President, to get this amendment passed. I want to thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor, and I notice the absence of a quorum. Mr. Kaka.